Um, thank you for the introduction. I'm here to talk uh, about reshipping mule scam, and this is somewhat related uh, to what you have just listened to. And funny enough, Brian Krebs is one of the authors uh, of this work with me and other people. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, financial data. Cyber criminals are out to get us, and one thing that they're really fond of is our financial information, usually debit card information, credit card information, anything that can be turned into a purchase. And they do this by, for example, performing large-scale breaches, those that go in the front pages of the New York Times, like Home Depot and Target. But there are also many, many small breaches that are never disclosed, sometimes because they're not disclosed, sometimes because they're not even detected. In addition to that, there is also a very acti active community of fishers that are out on the internet try to trick users in s into volunteering their own information. And this is another source of this financial information. Finally, we have malware. There are specific families of malware whose only goal is to sit on your computer, wait until you go to an e-commerce site or to a bank, and collect your personal information and send it somewhere, uh, wherever the bot herder uh, is located. And actually, uh, a few years ago, uh, me and my team captured one of these botnets. We were able to sort of leverage a little mistake that one of these cyber criminals uh, made, and we were able to control this botnet and collect the information that normally would be sent to the cyber criminal. We collected more than 60 gigabytes of personal information, login to website, credit card information, banking information, and we published a study on how much could be made with all this data. And we found out that it was quite a bit. But then we went on and said, okay, now you have this financial data in your hand. You're a cyber criminal. How do you turn this into real money or into real goods? You need to have that because otherwise information is just information. So how to monetize this? How to monetize credit card information? That's uh, not so easy. Once upon a time it was easy. You can just take the financial data, find a way to transfer some money into a bank account or, for example, uh, clone a debit card and physically go to the ATM machine and start getting cash out. That's awesome. This guy seems to be very happy. Of course, this doesn't work for a number of reasons, mostly because you have to be present in front of an ATM. And in fact, what you see here is uh, Albert Gonzalez, one of the most notorious uh, cyber criminals of this kind. And interestingly enough, he was responsible for some of the largest uh, financial breaches in the history of the internet, but he was caught because around midnight it was in front of an ATM putting one card, another card, another card, another card, another card around midnight because at midnight they will cycle the limit for a certain card so it could extract twice as much the money. It didn't help that he was wearing a female wig at the time to avoid being recognized by the cameras. And uh, a, a cop noticed the suspicious guy and apprehended him. Another way to monetize then is to use money mules. So they're a way to recruit people. So they will go on your behalf at the ATM, extract the money, the physical money, and go to Western Union, for example, and ship the money to the Ukraine. Of course, the bank soon got into this and are very good at identifying this type of accounts and they shut them down very, very fast. Then they decided, okay, we cannot make cash, let's buy goods. So the next step was let's buy very expensive objects that I can buy on Amazon and let, uh, let's ship them, for example, to Ukraine. There is a war there, you cannot really ship uh, weapons, but you know, uh, this is a rifle infrared scope. This costs around you know, five times more than, a rifle itself, than the rifle itself. So it's very um, useful to be able to buy these goods and then buy a cheap rifle somewhere else. Of course, merchants 
realized that this was the source of a lot of fraud and decided to stop the purchase or the shipping, to be more precise, of this kind of goods to the outside world. Oops. Okay. Sorry, this is the wonderful Hyatt network. So, of course, the idea is now let's do a reshipping scan. Let's use the same model that we use for financial data. So let's recruit people and have them ship these goods for us. And this is something that has been going for a while. And in fact, there are you know, several documentation, several warnings from the government say, please do not fall for this scam. So it's a known scam. So what is our work? Our work was uh, focused on analyzing the largest amount of real hard data that was ever collect on this type of operation. We stumble about, upon a huge amount of information that describe the internals of how reshipping uh, scams are carried out. And we decided as scientists, hey, let's understand this. Let's measure it. Let's see how the different actors interact with each other. And maybe we can find a way to actually intervene in this, op in this operation uh, in a way that is effective, sort of similar to what Damon did with uh, credit card processors. And so what are the actors? The actors here are, of course, the, uh, the drop this, this we'll see is the person that is actually asked to reship the goods. The cardholder, a reshipping scam site, somebody that we call the stuffer, which is the guy who actually have to move these goods, and the merchant that is the target of the fraud. So the first thing that happens is the reshipping scam site decides to publish a job ad, a job ad. And you have seen these ads. It's like, work for home, make a ton of money. You don't have to do pretty much anything. You will be one of our fantastic employees that are able to do $4,000 working one hour a day. And my wife, for example, work, used to work at a city college in the career center and she was responsible for the job ads, she would see variations of these scams daily. And of course, since she's my wife, he was able to filter them correctly, but that's not always the case. So you can go on Craigslist, but also on university website and find this type of ads. So the next step, the next step is uh, one of the drop, so a person applies for the job and you know, trying to make an extra buck, maybe uh, is a working, um, it, it's a, somebody working multiple jobs. And <clears throat> at this point, the stuffer that has stolen the cardholder information by phishing, by using breach data, and so forth, contact the scam site and say, hey, I need to ship some goods. And say, no problem. The stuffer, so the guy who stole the credit card, buys something at the merchant, and as the recipient of the shipping good, specify the drop. So the transaction happens, the goods are sent to the drop, the drop actually opens the box and takes pictures. And these are real pictures from the data that we collected on these scams. These are pictures that the drop sends to the reshipping scam site, say, look, I really received your PlayStation I hope it's a PlayStation, I cannot really tell. Uh, or some very luxury good that I will have to reship. They take the box uh, away, I mean, it takes a good and put it in another box. They obtain a new shipping label from the scammer site, say, oh, please send it to somewhere in Moscow. They go to the USPS and they ship the good. The stuffer receives the good and then they resell the good on the black market or even not so black market as we have discovered, making a profit because of course they bought the good with stolen credit cards. So it's very, very, um, um, they can make a lot of money out of it. So we collected all this data through a, a series of sources. Brian Krebs has some data, the FBI had some data, uh, anonymous concerned citizen dumped on us a lot of this data and of course, you know, at being uh, an academic research, we had to do a lot of uh, checks and balances. I can detail that later. But fundamentally, we got uh, months and months of real-world data, complete dumps of the databases of the shipping scam operation. We had even their 
uh, message logs, their bulletin board system, the discussion about setting up contracts between Stuffer and uh, scam sites. And we saw a lot of logs, a lot of actual transfer with labels, with full uh, information about who was involved, including the passport, social security numbers, everything. And so we start looking at it and say, okay, the question is like, how do they, how do they make this work? How do they split the, the profit? What, what, what are they really send out? What are the type of products? And how do they actually ship the stuff? Because eventually, it's the US Postal Service that moves the parcels and move the parcels from one place to another. Sorry about that. So the first thing, it was pretty simple. We found that there are two main models of sharing profit. If it's something really expensive, the scam side wants a cut of it, 50%. If it's something not very expensive, could be fashion or things like that, then usually there is you know, sort of a fixed fee per package. And they, they just said it. It's just a normal reaction. They know that they're doing something illegal, but of course, this is not a blocker. And this contract have concept like customer service level, uh, customer satisfaction. Uh, they promise they will monitor the performance of their drops, the mule, and make sure that they will pay back in case somebody is misbehaving. It's pretty sophisticated. And what is actually exchange in this, in this type of scams? Well, mostly I would say tech. And with technology, we means Apple products are very popular. Uh, video games, consoles, uh, camera, like lenses, uh, are very expensive and they're very small. So they're a good candidate for this type of uh, activity. Also, fashion is very important, apparently, especially in Russia. We think that in part is because of the various sanctions that created uh, some kind of attrition for certain goods and make them very appealing. Uh, for these type of scams. So for example, uh, there was a site that was almost exclusively de de dedicated to Apple products. We find another site that was more focusing on, um, uh, on fashion. And as somebody from Italy, I was very uh, moved by that. But <clears throat> in general, about 70% of the goods goes into these two main categories. So. The other interesting thing is how do they actually send a package from one place to another? Because there is the, the mule, the drop, is in some place in the United States, receives the goods, has to get this label to ship this thing to Russia. And so what they do, initially, they decided, hey, we have stolen credit cards. Why don't we use the stolen credit cards to buy the labels to send out the goods that were bought with the stolen credit cards. Fits perfectly. Here, these were called black labels. They did a little bit of black labeling, and soon the United Post Office said, mm, no, we have to check this a little more, and so these became unavailable. Introduced white labels. So immediately, this crashing the black label created an opportunity for uh, the cyber criminals. They said, oh, there is a new service. We can create something that looks like we are actually a company that buys a lot of USPS labels and then resells them, but we're going to buy all these labels losing, using uh, legitimate money or legitimate looking money, so it looks like we are just intermediaries and we're selling labels to people that need them at a lower price. And the difference is that actually while black labels were outrageously less expensive than USPS, white labels are just a little bit less expensive than actual USPS labels. Another thing that is important is that a lot of the labeling can depend on the type of goods that you are declaring. And as part of the scam, the cyber criminal declares something slightly different for the package than what's really inside. For example, they might say that it's a used camera, while instead it's a, well instead it's a perfectly brand new camera. And so we did a, actually an analysis on the distribution and cost of the labels. And for sites that uh, had high value goods where the cut was sort of like somewhat proportional, we can see that the distribution of the label tends to be more linear. 
while for others, we'll see for the blue and black here, it's more around, you know, it's more sort of a uh, almost fixed price. And we find out that the white labels were around $100 per package. So they have a good, a good thing going on. So we started looking at who is sort of like the victim in this scam, who is losing money, and how, mu how much money is actually in this type of scam. In terms of victims, we look at the main victim. I would say the main victim is the merchant, because of course, they lose the goods. It's very difficult to return the goods to the merchant. And also the drop that, as we will see, is left with no payment, and sometimes is even the victim of identity fraud. And this is really terrible. These people are oftentimes people in need of extra money. They apply for this job somewhat in a state of desperation. They never get paid, and eventually they use the information they collected when they set up their job, their account, to actually steal their information, their identity. Sorry. Uh, other victims, however, are not uh, to be left out. The cardholder has to go through the hassle of reverting charges and things like that. The card issuer, of course, also is affected. And the destination country of the goods, because oftentimes certain taxes cannot be applied exactly because of this. So how big is the market? We, we had so much data that could actually plot and interpolate how many packages were sent, and we could determine uh, sort of like the trend of this different website. And we did an analysis of how many packages were sent each year uh, by interpolating the data. We look at the cost of the medium packages and we identify that each of these sites was doing more or less $7 million of revenue per year. But how big is the market? Well, in order to understand that, we had to understand how many cardholders are out there. And we did this using a capture recapture mechanism. This is something that biologists do to determine a population. They get a group of people, they a group of animals, they tag them, they send them in the wild, they get another group of animals, and they see how much uh, intersection between these two sets there was. So we use as this two of the members of the two sites that, oh, two of the sites that we had, and we estimated in a conservative way that we had 1.6 million victims for a total of 1.8 billion per year for this type of scam alone. We also look at how drop were recruited. We found out very interestingly and somewhat unsurprisingly, since we had already anecdotal evidence, that <clears throat> people are hired, used, and then thrown away exactly when they sh they're supposed to be paid. And we had even the messages from the forums that say, hey, where is my check? And that was the last time that that particular person, that particular mule was actually contacted. So people think that these scams work. Well, they work for the cyber criminal, but they don't work for the mules that are left without any pay. In terms of where are the mules? Well, we did an analysis. We found some kind of correlation with um, higher than normal um, unemployment, and this is normal and expected as this type of scam actually obviously try to target people in need, uh, people that are um, looking for an extra buck because maybe are in a depressed economy. So what are we going to do about this? There are several intervention approaches. One first round, interestingly enough, is tracking who is tracking. Meaning that why somebody from Russia is going to the USPS tracking website to reload, 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 reload to find out where the package has been moved at this point in time. And if we can identify, use patterns of who's accessing this information in order to identify anomalous situation, we can at least track the package even before it is reshipped. Another thing that we can do is to do analysis of the shipping labels. Why a certain account from one guy is used to pay for shipping that goes from many different guys to the same guy in Russia. There are many patterns that can show that this is actually fraudulent. And finally, we can use destination as a target for this. 
And our analysis show that uh, the vast majority of the packages go to Moscow. Of course, this is not a single signal that can be used, but it's obvious that you know 85% of the goods that are shipped with this scam are out there. So, what are our conclusions? This is a big scam, and that's why, for example, the FBI was interested in collaborating with us uh, in trying to map and understand how this was carried out. But we need something new. We need a new way to use network information and graph that represent how the different uh, actors and objects being shipped interact with each other in order to be able to do an effective job at stopping this type of scam. Unfortunately, this information is spread in so many different places. There is the U United States Postal Service. There is the FBI. There are, you know, the IRS. There are the credit, par the credit card processors. There are the prepaid card processor. There are the merchants. And it is very difficult to have all these people work together in order to identify in a clear way who are the cyber criminals in action. This is not just my work, it's a work with many people, including um, uh, Mike Eubanks from the FBI and Brian Krebs, who provided uh, us with some of the data. And with this, I'm ready for some questions. <laughs>